Let's um, turn to Matthew 25, and we're going to read 25, verse 20, I mean, chapter 25, verse 14 through 30. And we're going to read a story about investing. And let's start with verse 14. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. I want to give you a background. Jesus is teaching his disciples He's sharing and he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. What he's talking about is the spiritual realm. And he tells this story to illustrate some real deep principles, spiritual principles about life or about eternity. He's not talking about earthly principles. He's talking about spiritual principles. And he talks about a man, a man a story of a man going on a long trip. Um, he called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. He then left on a trip. This portion of scripture is, divide, is talking about a man that he's rich and he has servants. And he's taken off on a trip, but when he takes off on the trip, he releases some of his resources to his servants. He calls his servants together and he says, I have resources for you to invest. I'm going to give you some. I still want my business to grow while I'm gone. I'm going to be going on a trip. I'm on a vacation. I'm coming back, but I still want progress in my business. So let's keep on going with this story. In verse 16, the servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. So he takes off, but he comes back. And now there's a time of accountability. And he wants to, how did you use the money? In verse 19, so no, verse 20, the servant to whom he had entrusted five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I've earned five more. The, ma the master was full, of, was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Now the, sec the, the servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest and I've earned two more. The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant, and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank at least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money away from this servant and give it to the one with 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from, but from those who do nothing, even do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant 
into utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now we're sharing this story. And as we're going through this story, for one man, it doesn't end very well. And what I want to do is just give you some three, three facts about investing. But before I do that, I, want to, I just want to define what an investment is. An investment is this, something that we put our money, time, and effort in that offers a profitable return, such as interest, income, appreciation and value, or a desired result. It's something we put our time, our money, and effort in that offers a profitable return, such as interest, income, appreciation and value, and a desired result. Now this, this man, he's rich and he gives his servants some of his money. And it was a lot of money, five bags of silver, two bags of silver, and then he gave one person one bag of silver. So I wanna give you three facts about investing. Fact number one, God has given all of us something to invest. In this story, it's not described that he gave one of them nothing. He gave every single one of these servants something to work with. And this is what God is saying to us. Let's make this very practical. God's given every single one of us something to work with. Now, he's not given it to you to waste it, to hide it, to bury it, but to invest it. Because God is an investor. He invests in us for a return. Now, in this story, not everybody gets the same amount of talent or the same amount of resources. You know what that means? Not every single one of us are at the same level of finances. Not every one of us is at the same level of talent. Not every single one of us is at the same level of intelligence or opportunities, but every single one of us have some talent and every single one of us have some resources. And God is just saying this, I'm not gonna compare, compare you what I want you to do is do the best with what you have. You know, there's, there's certain things that I could do well, and there's certain things that I cannot do so well. Um, I, I, I'm really good at leading, but I'm not really good at singing. So God's not going to put me against my wife, Lisa, and say, I want you to sing as good as her or my daughters, because I will lose that battle. But it's not a competition with anybody. This is what God is saying. Every one of you I have a purpose for, every one of you I've invested in, and every one of you can use what I've given you and can produce a profitable return. So what does God say? Fact number one, God has given all of us something to invest. Now there's something about the, in the amount that he gave. When I look at it, well, he's saying he gave one five. He gave five bags of silver. He gave another two bags of silver. And then he gave another one, one bag of silver. And then I go, why? Well, the scripture says why. He gave it according to their ability. This is what God is saying. He'll get, never give you more than you can handle. He gives you according to your ability. But well, how does he determine Ability. Ability has to do with another word, capacity. Capacity or, or, uh, or I would say capacity to do or act physically, mentally, morally, or financially. So how does God figure ability? This is how God figures ability, by past performance. So it's kind of like credit. That means if you have bad credit, you only qualify... I was in a car business for 14 years. And the first, one of the first things we do when you're trying to buy a car is run your credit. Now, once in a while, we'll get a person that comes in. The most expensive car we had on the lot at that time was either a Corvette or a Denali GMC. So a Denali back in those days was right around $50,000. Today, a Denali is right around $100,000, eighty dollars to 
And once in a while, someone would come in and say, I want the Denali. And I go, wow, not too many people come in for that vehicle because it's super expensive and the payments are really high. So what we would do is, is do a walk around on the car and, get, and, and then we'd take a test drive. Then we'd get a credit app and then we'd run the credit. And once in a while, we'd run the credit and the person's credit was not so good. The last two cars they had were repossessed. And I'm not trying to break somebody's heart here if you want a Denali and you just had two repossessions. But you might have to crawl before you go ahead and walk. And, and this is what we do is we look at the credit and based on the credit, the banks would determine what that person was able to finance. And, and so, so we would look at it and we'd say, oh, based on your credit background and based on your finances, because right now you're, you're making you're making minimum wage. This car, just probably the payment is going to be over $1,000 a month. This is probably not the best car for you. We do have a car for you. And then we would show them something that was within their budget, with, it was in their means. We're not saying that person couldn't buy a Denali in the future. We're just saying right now, based on their past performance, their ability, or based on their credit, they qualify for this. Now, why did I say all that? Because every single one of us right now are interviewing right now by our present actions, our present investments, our present attitudes are determining what we qualify for in the future. You guys get that? So, so this is what God was looking at. He was saying based on past performance, as, as they've handled my business, this person has been really faithful, so I'll give them five bags of silver based on how responsible they've been with the last two bags of silver I gave them before. Now, this other person, um, they now have two bags of silver because I gave them one before and they really worked that one really good, so let me give them two now. And then the one that got one was probably someone that he wasn't really faithful, but he gave them an opportunity. And you know what's so good about this is that every single one of us, God's invested in, and God gives every single one of us an opportunity to grow spiritually or grow or invest what we have. You guys get that? So the portion of the scripture, he starts giving out the gift. So fact number one, God has given all of us something to invest. Number two, Everyone that invests will get a return. Now, in this portion of scripture, we see one with five bags of, uh, ba bags of silver. What does he do? He invests. Some will say he what? He invests. I mean, he uses his talent. He uses his time. He uses his finances. He uses his resources. And he puts it to work. And then at the end, he, come, he doubles his investment. He had five bags. By the time he was done, he had 10 bags of silver. Great job investing. The other one, the other one with two, you know what he does? He invests his two. And what does he do? Double his money. Good job. Now, if, if you were entrusting someone with your investments, and they doubled your investments, would you trust them with more of your investments? Well, God's the same. When we're responsible, we're not talking about salvation here. What we're talking about is God's resources, God's, God's, God's favor, God's people. And God says, can I trust you with my people? Can I trust you with my finances? Can I trust you with my vision? And God says, yes, I can. Because when I gave you those two people, you took care of them. Now let me give you four. You know, I could trust you. I could trust you now with more income. Because when you were making a thousand a month, you tithe your $100. And you were faithful with that. Let me release more of my resources to you. Because if I give them to you, 
you'll invest it in my kingdom and I will get a return. Is that good? You know, I'm going to give you an example. Um, last year, there's been a major stock. If you, if, you're invest, if you invest in stocks or anything like that, there was a major stock last year that had major, major growth. And some of you guys that are investors know Tesla. Tesla last year was at $72 a share. Last year, I just checked it. I was, I was online yeah, last night. It was $72 a share. Today, that same share is worth $4,030. $4,030. Now, you say, well, I, I was just on, I looked at it, it said $847. Yes, but it was split five ways. So it's five times eight turns into $4,030. I'll give you an example. If you invested $1,000 in Tesla last year, you would have over $55,000. A thousand would have turned into $55,974 today. If you put 10K, just 10K. Now, how, I'm not going to ask this question, but uh, some of us in this room had 10K. You had $10,000. The only problem, it's not 556,000 today, only not because you didn't have an opportunity, you just didn't invest it in Tesla. Right? How many get that? Without an investment, there's no return. With an investment, there's a what? When you invest your time, when you invest your efforts, when you invest your talents in, in the kingdom of God, God is saying it's a guaranteed return. But look at this. If you invested $20,000 that 20,000 would be, I'm talking about months ago. It would be 1,119,444 dollars. That's not, this is just doing this, intentionally investing. And what God is saying, are you impressed with that? Don't be impressed with that. Because when you invest in my kingdom, I'll give you way more than that. We got to get this in our spirit. God wants to do great things in our lives. I'm not talking about just finances. This is what I'm talking about. What God has for us is eternal. How many understand that? God has it eternal. He has eternal things for us. He has eternal breakthroughs for us. How many know in heaven, the streets are paved with gold? In heaven, we're in a place with no, no pain, no hurt, no suffering, no death, no devils, no resistance, no obstacles forever and ever and ever. And there's nothing that we can do. Come on, that's bigger than that on this earth. This is what I found out. Everything that we invest in on this earth, none of us take it with us. The only thing that really matters is what we invest for eternity. So let's take a look at this. Now, there's only two options. Some say two options. That's to invest or not invest. If you invest, God says, I guarantee you a return. I will bless you. You know, what we've been doing here at the church is investing over and over in people's lives. We are not in the same place that we started. We started without a church. We started with no finances. We started with no ministries. We started this ministry on the streets of San Bernardino, just knocking on doors. I remember that when God gave us instructions to start this church, me and my wife, I go, God, I don't even know how to start a church. How do I do it? And you know what God says? Go find some people, find out what their needs are, and just invest in them, just love them. So we knocked on a few doors and we found out that people were just hungry, some of them. And what we do is invest in them. And me and my wife would go to Stater Brothers and act like we were buying groceries for ourselves. We would buy the stuff that we liked and then we'd bring bags of groceries to their house and we'd just say, here, God bless you, God loves you, and we love you. We're still doing that today. Today, that's last weekend, we went to Pomona. And we're in Pomona right now investing. 
And we're believing that in Pomona, the harvest we're going to get is souls coming to Jesus to eternal life. But we're investing. So Pastor Robert said he went down into Pomona and we're picking, you know, where we're investing in, in the areas nobody else wants to invest in. We go to the toughest neighborhoods we can find and we are investing there. People think, oh, there's never going to be a return there. You should find a good neighborhood to start a church in. But that's not how God works. God uses regular people like me and you that have nothing going for us, some of us. And, and then what he does, he pours in his resources, his blessings, his giftings. And he says, I'm going to do something great with you. So we went to a, a, a neighborhood this week and we, walked, we, wrote, we went down a street and, and there was a house. We knocked on the door. And we asked her, what are your needs? And she had her, her front window in her house. It was just blown out. It was broken. So um, Pastor Robert asked her, well, how'd that happen? She goes, uh, we don't want to get into that. Just put it this way. Someone got angry and, and broke the window. I go, so how, she said, what's going on? He goes, we have no money to replace that window. And she says, and Pastor Robert goes, you don't? And he, he said to her, will you allow us to help you with that window? She goes, oh, no, 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 don't do that. You don't have to do that. So, no, we, we, we want to do that. We want to help you with that window. So what we did was we sent a window person over there this week, and they put a brand new window. She ends up calling Pastor Robert up and saying, thank you so much. You did not need to do this for us. And she was just crying, so grateful that God, through the church, helped her get that window. But she goes on to share three days later. She said, me and my boyfriend prayed last week for the first time in our lives. And this is what we ask. We want help. She's Vietnamese and she's, she's I would say, more Buddhist than anything. And, and they pray, and then her boyfriend just got out of prison, and he asked her, well, you're going to pray to which God? It goes, because, because he told her, you guys have all kinds of gods. I don't know which one you're going to pray to. And she goes, let's just do it this way. We don't know which God, so let's just be generic and just say God. And we'll see which one answers. So she prays, two days later, our Adopt-A-Block team is knocking on her door. The God that answered is the God that's alive, and his name is Jesus Christ. She ended up giving her life to Jesus because she realized Jesus is alive. You guys said the investment. Someone say investment. There's no return without an investment. Someone had to go in that knock on that door and then we bought a window. But I'll tell you this, we reached a soul. Her and her boyfriend gave their lives to Jesus. And once she gave her life to Jesus, she goes, how can I join you guys? Next week, she's going to go and adopt the block with us. And this is, she said, this is what I want to do. I want to make cookies for my neighbors. She said, I'm a baker. So she's making a whole bunch of cookies. And then she said this. Can we write something on the cookies? And then Pastor Robert says, well, what should we put on the cookies? She goes, I don't know. He goes, think about it. What should we put on them? She goes, how about this? God is love. And Pastor Robert goes, that's perfect. God is love on every cookie. Let's do that. So how does that happen? How does a group of people go in the neighborhood, save a soul, see this harvest, by someone willing to invest a Saturday morning, put in a couple hours, knock on a door, and a church that's willing to take their finances and go ahead and buy a window. And as we're buying a window, there's a return on our investment. And the return on our investment is a soul reach for eternity. Isn't that good news? So everyone that invests will get a return on their investment. Just know that. Not every investment in this world is there a return. What I mean by that is there's some, some investments that are high risk that promise high return. High risk investments 
and produce, it, it promised a high return. But the chances are you could lose everything. But there's an investment that you make in this life that's guaranteed to produce a harvest. And that's your investment in the kingdom of heaven. What you do for eternity will always guarantee produce a result or produce a profit or produce gain or produce a value greater than you put in. That's what's so great about investment. You put in this and you get that. You always get more than you put in. So God is just saying, let's be aware. Of course, you have a lot of financial investments or earthly investments, but let's make sure we're also making sure that we're, uh, we're practicing investing into our eternity. And the greatest return I could ever have on my investment is seeing another soul, another brother, another sister, another friend, a neighbor with me for eternity. Let's give the Lord a hand. Come on, this is some good stuff. And number three, number three fact. Someone say number three fact. One day we will give an account to God for what we did with what God gave us. In Matthew 25, 19, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. Whose money was it? It was his money. And he comes back and he says, Understand this, it was my breath that gave you breath. I'm the one that gave you the intelligence. I'm the one that gave you the resources. I'm the one that gave you the opportunity. I'm the one that gave you the health. I gave you the resources. I gave you the finances. I gave it to you. And I want to make sure, he goes, of course, I want you to enjoy life. But I want you to be aware how short life is and just make sure that you're investing into eternity as well. Now, I know this, everyone that's tuned in is investing. Everyone that's here today is investing. People might be asking you, why would you invest your Sunday? Some of you, this is your only day off and you're coming to the house of God. Why are you doing that? because you're investing into your eternity. And what you're saying is this hour is more important than every other hour because this hour is dedicated to eternity. Someone say, I'm investing. Why would someone come on Tuesday nights and go through discipleship classes? Because what they're doing is investing in their spiritual walk. They're investing in their spiritual growth. They're investing in their relationship with God. Why would someone become a P12 small group leader and disciple a group of people and invest every week with them, time, effort, and love? Because they're investing into eternity. And what they're saying, these lives that I'm investing in are more important than anything that I do in my life. You know this, and I know this. At the end... It doesn't matter if you have 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, $10 or $500. You're not going to take it with you. You're going to leave it all behind. Every ounce of gold and silver that has ever been on earth is still here on earth. The only thing that you'll ever take out of this earth, you don't even take real estate with you. I own this real estate. You don't own it. You're just leasing it. Because after you're gone, the, the real estate gets transferred to somebody else. But understand this, it all still belongs to God. It all stays here. The only thing that's going to last for eternity are the things that we do to impact other people's lives for eternity. And what we're doing right now is God's saying, invest right now in souls. Invest your time and effort in the things of God. And you, I guarantee you this, you will not regret it. I'm going to give you just three quick things that we can invest in. There's three ways that we can invest. Number one, we can invest our talent and time by serving in a ministry. Someone say this, invest your time and talent by serving in a ministry. First Peter 4.10 says this, just as one of you has received a special gift, a spiritual talent, an ability graciously given by God, employ it in serving one another as it is appropriate for good stewards of God's multifaceted grace, faithfully using the diverse, varied 
gifts and abilities got granted to Christians by God's unmerited favor. All he's saying here is use what I've given you to serve others, to serve in the church. How can we apply this? Well, sign up and serve in a ministry this year. Make it a goal. I'm not just going to come to church. I want to serve in a ministry this year. And you might just start with serving just once a month, but get the ball rolling. Use your gifts and talents for God. There's a great reward in doing that. Or I'm going to give you an example. Right now, our children's ministry has 50 open spots to minister to our children. 50 spots. We got more spots in our Arrowhead campus, in our downtown campus, a little rougher crowd over there. But we got opportunities. If you're saying, I can handle those rough necks, come on, we want you. All right? And, and some of you have a talent of changing diapers. We need your talent. I'm a professional diaper changer. I can change, change a diaper in 2.5 seconds flat, faster than, a, faster than a Corvette 0 to 60. Great, we need your help. But whatever gifts and talents you have, use them because there's opportunities. And it might be just, like I said, volunteer once a month or once a week or however God leads you, but volunteer. Use your gifts to serve one another. Another way that we can invest is we can invest in the preaching of the gospel. The results, the results will be souls being saved. In Luke 10, 2, it says this. He was saying to them, the harvest is abundant for there are many who need to hear the good news about salvation. But the workers, those available to proclaim the message of salvation are few. Therefore, prayerfully ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. Now what he's saying is there's a lot of people just like this young lady that we met on the streets that need to hear the good news about Jesus. So how can we practice this? Well, let's say, God, I want you to send somebody and start sending me. This is how you can make sure you're preaching the gospel and investing. Share your faith with somebody else. Or maybe do this. Invite someone to church so they can hear about eternal life. Or maybe, or, or do this, or, or I think all of it. Invest financially to support the ministry so Adopt the Block can go out there and we're doing this collectively. Individually we do it and collectively we do it. When a soul gets saved on the streets, it goes on all of our accounts. It's a, it's a, what God is saying, you invested and here there's more. There's more souls being saved. There's more lives being transformed. Great job. We're doing this individually and we're doing this collectively. So every time someone gives their life to Jesus, we have accomplished the assignment that God has us here for. And all the investments that we make into the kingdom of God are worthwhile. This is the only place that we could actually invest um, finances that turns into souls. Everywhere else you put finances and it could turn into a brand new TV. You put your finances in, it could turn into more money. But when we invest in the kingdom of God, or we support the local church, this turns in to souls being saved for eternity. That's worth it. There was a, another story this week that I heard. There was a, one of our members of our church that um, saw a young man hitchhiking on the street. He saw him hitchhiking, and this couple that saw this young man hitchhiking said, he's so young, and and the husband said, why don't we just stop and pick him up? And his wife said, I don't think that's a good idea. We don't ever pick up hitchhikers. But he just felt moved. He goes, no, nah, honey, let's, stop. let's pick him up. He's a young kid. So they picked him up. They picked him up and they found out that this young man, I think his name was Jose, that he um, ran away from a group home in Fontana. And he was just turning 18 years old. So he wanted to party on the streets at 18 years old. And, and if he's in a group home, he's ready, to get, he's ready to get aged out anyways. He goes, I got nothing to lose. They're going to kick me out anyways at 18. So I'm ready just to party. So he's on the streets and hitchhiking. And he's trying to get back to Fontana. So this is what happens. They, they pick him up. 
And they didn't want to take him back to the Fontana, but they took him to Fontana. But they offered him, you know we have a men's home, we have a women's home, we have a group home. We'd love for you to come in. Well, he got a number for that young man, Jose, and he, he put it in his phone, but no one, no one ever answered the phone. So he lost contact with him, but this is what happened. This week, after two weeks of that original encounter, this young man calls back. But, this, but our member doesn't really recognize the phone number, but it says the name. And, and then his wife said, well, that last name sounds familiar because I got family that has that last name. Go ahead and answer. It might be one of my cousins. So he answers the phone, and lo and behold, is this young kid, Jose. So they talk to him. He goes, I need help. I, I'm struggling. Thank you so much. I'm the kid you picked up that was hitchhiking. He goes, oh, okay, I got you. So it, what ended up happening, the wife said, that, your last name, that sounds real familiar. We got family that has that last name. And who's your mother? And this is what they found out. His mother was her cousin. So all this time, they thought they were investing in a stranger. They were actually investing in their own family. And this young man now has an opportunity to get saved, have eternal life, because someone was willing to go the extra mile and invest. This is what God is saying. Let's invest to see souls saved. And this is the last thing. We can invest our finances. So we can invest our time and talent. We can invest our, by preaching the gospel. And we can invest our finances. And this is what God says. If we give, we will receive. Look at Luke 6, 38. It says, give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. Wow, that's interesting. That God has set this up that giving always produces a return. Now, why does giving always produce a return? Because God wants you in a position to always be able to give. So God is saying, you'll never outgive me. As long as you're a giver, you'll always have sufficient for your own needs. But not only that, you'll always have some overflow to continue helping others. And that's why organizations that are given and investing in the less fortunate always eventually have resources. Why? Because it's a spiritual law. If you give to take care of the needs of my kingdom, the needs of people, I'll make sure that you receive in return more than you gave. Press down, shaken together and running over. Understand this. With no investment, there's no receiving. With an investment, there's a return. There's a what? And this is the last thing we're going to do. We're, we're still part of it. Is right now, we're bringing a first fruit offering as an investment that honors God and releases God's increase in every area of our lives. Now, first fruit offering. This offering we're bringing on, on, this, on January 31st. This is specifically mentioned in the scripture, and it's called, that first fruit offering in, in the Hebrew is called reshith. It's a certain offering. It, it means the first in place and time at the beginning, the most important chief, highest rank, or first whole. What he's saying, this is a really important offering because it sets the stage for the whole year. It's kind of like a DNA on it. I'm going to bless, what you're saying is, this year, God, you're going to be number one in my life. So out of my first increase of income that comes in, I'm going to take a portion of that and just honor you with it or worship you with it because I realize that what I have came from you anyways. Thank you, Lord. And I want you to take this and I want you to speak your blessing over it so that it represents all the increase or all the finances I'll receive all year long or it represents every part of my life Look, I'm giving you my life. And God says, if you'll give me a portion of your first, this is what I'll do. Look at the scripture, this last verse. In Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your crops or income. Then your barns will be abundantly filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. In Proverbs 3, 9, it says this, in the, in the Passion Translation, it says, glorify God with all your wealth 
honor him with your best, with every increase that comes to you. Then every dimension of your life will overflow with blessings from an uncontainable source of inner joy. I love this. What God is saying, if you'll just bless me with an investment into your future, into my kingdom, as an act of worship to me, this is what I promise you. Every dimension of your life will be filled with my blessing and its source will be inner joy. How many would like to have a year of some joy in your life, some peace in your life? The rewards are all the same. The investors get rewards. In this portion of scripture, we see the ones that invested. God said, well done, good and faithful servant. You know what we call that? Praise. And then the next thing he says, you've been faithful a little, let me give you more. You know what, God, what that's called? Increase. And then at the end he goes, let's all celebrate together. And you know what that's called? The joy of the Lord. And God says every investor will experience three things. They will experience me praising them. The next thing, they'll experience increase of responsibilities and resources in their lives. Next year will be more than this year. And at the end, it will, he will bless them in their emotions. Or I would even say this, a quality of life or eternal life that could only be experienced with those that trust the one that's invested in you. And today, before we leave this building, I want to give every single one of you an opportunity. So there's an opportunity for you to give your life to the greatest cause you could ever give your life to. Can we all please stand up, please? How many know God is good? I'm, I'm proud of every single one of you that are here this morning. And, and I want you to think about this. The story started out with the kingdom of heaven. Someone say heaven. And this was to illustrate a spiritual realm. And it's saying this, that this life on earth is short. And one day we'll all stand before God and give an account for our moments, our days, our talents, our abilities. We all stand before God. There was two servants that ended up with some really great results. He said, enter into the joy of the Lord. Enter into heaven. Enter into my fullness. Enter into my joy. Enter into my peace. Enter into my freedom. Enter into a new beginning. And you might be in this room and you're feeling like, I have no joy. I have no peace. I'm depressed. I'm fearful. I'm full of anxiety. I'm hurting. I'm broken. I've experienced some really bad news. I don't know how I'm going to overcome. And you know what God is saying? Today, I've invested. God, this is what God said. I invested. Would you invest, God? I invested my son my only son, he died for your sins. He suffered. He went through pain and agony. Why? To pay the price for all the wrong we've done. You know what that means? Stop living. You don't have to live in shame. You don't have to live in guilt. You don't have to live in regret because the price for your new beginning, the price for your forgiveness has already been paid. There was an investment that God made. It was his son. Why did, was he willing to invest such a high price, his only son? Because the return on the investment was so valuable. And do you know the only return God wants is a relationship with you. He didn't die to judge you. He died to save you. He died to give you a new life. And he's saying, you can enter now into my joy, into my peace, into my eternal life. There's a life that you could only find in God. And this is the reality. You're going to live this whole life and invest it properly. Or you're going to live this whole life and waste it. And you're going to start feeling like your life is just a waste. Like what am I doing with my life? 
You were not created to be an alcoholic. You were not created to be angry for the rest of your life with everybody that you know. You were not meant to live a life of total frustration and lies and deception. You are meant to live a life of purpose, increase, growth, eternal life. God has a wonderful plan for you. And he says, I've invested in you and I want to invest more into you today. Will you allow God to invest in you today? The most important investment, it's his son in your life or forgiveness or eternal life. You're thinking, man, there has to be more to life than this. And God says, absolutely, there's more. Today's your day to enter into a relationship with God. And without God, you know what happens? It just seems life passes us by and we feel really empty. So I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for one second. You guys have been such a great crowd today. But now is your opportunity to receive the gift of eternal life. The gift that we're offering now is more important than any other gift you could ever receive in your life. It's forgiveness of sins. It's eternal life. It's just this young lady, this Vietnamese lady at her door. She received this gift. You can receive it today. I'm going to ask you a real simple question. If today were, the, were your last day on earth, it was here, it could be. And you were right now standing before God on that day of accountability. And you're standing before him. Are you going to be part of those servants that are glad to meet the Lord? Because you know you're right with him. You know you've been forgiven. You know that if you were to die, you have eternal life. Or you're saying, Pastor, if today were my last day, I'm not sure if I'm right with God. I'm really not. Um, I, I'm not sure that if I died now, I would go to heaven. He would say, well done. You did it. You did it. You accepted my son. You accepted my gift. You accepted eternal life. Today's your moment. Jesus is knocking at your heart's door. And he said, I'll forgive you. I'm not here to judge you. I'll forgive you. I'll set you free. I'll give you a new life. I'll give you eternal life. I'll give you what you've been looking for all along. Today is your day. As he's knocking at your heart's door, say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm right, but I want to get right with God. I want to be forgiven. I want a new start. I want a new beginning. I want a new beginning. It's your choice. Will you say yes? Because if you say yes, God's already said yes to you. It's kind of like this. He's picked you to be on his team. Will you say, okay, I want to be on your team? Because today you're being picked. You're not rejected. You've been chosen. Let's pray right now. If you're saying, Pastor, that's me. I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to be forgiven of my sins. Let's pray right now together. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I ask you now to forgive me of all my sins. I believe you died on the cross and you rose again from the dead for me, Lord. I'm tired of living the way I've been living. Today, I'm done with my old life and I call on you, Jesus, to save me. Make me new. Give me eternal life. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand. Now, how many said that prayer and you meant it? You gave your life to Jesus today. You meant it. Raise your hand real quick. You gave your life to Jesus and you meant it. This is what I want you to do. I want you to do one more step. I, I would love to have just one, one last moment with you. Just a special prayer. And I want you to leave your seat and I want you to come up here real quick. I just want you to come up here real quick because what we want to do, this is your first step that you're taking in your new life. If you raise your hand, just come forward real quick. Let's give them a hand that's coming forward. If you raise your hand, just come forward real quick. Let's give them a congratulations. Come on, let's celebrate someone giving their life to Jesus, starting a new life today. Come on, let's give the Lord. Come on, celebrate. Tell her heaven celebrated. Let's go ahead and celebrate. Awesome. Wife, Carlos' wife is up in the front. Awesome. Let's praise the Lord for that. How many understand? It was worth the investment of this time today for you, for you, for you, for you.
Father, right now, we're going to pray with you, but I'm going to say, Father, right now, each one of them made a decision to follow you for the rest of their lives. And right now, Father, they've also taken a step of faith and saying, I'm ready. I'm taking a step. And I thank you, Lord, that you're going to help them with their next step, their next step, their next step. They will not be the same person they are today, a month from now, two months from now, three months from now, because they're going to grow. They're going to invest their time. They're going to invest every Sunday. They're going to show up to church. They're going to get a Bible. They're going to start reading. They're going to sign up for classes. They're going to get baptized. They are going to grow massively. And whatever that's holding them down, Father, I thank you, Lord, they are free right now. Free from addiction, free from the past, free from the hurt. Father, heal their broken hearts. And I command every devil in hell that's come against them, I command you in the name of Jesus, let them go. They now belong to Christ. They've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. They are saved, they're born again, and now they're true disciples of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, we just thank you. Fill them with your Holy Spirit and power. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand. We love you. God bless you, church. This Wednesday, it's going to be awesome. You don't want to miss it. Impartation Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We love you. You need prayer? Please come up. We'd love to pray with you, too. We have a whole team of love to pray with you. God bless you.